I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Ricky Sandrani, Vice President, is a member of the pricing assurance team and assists clients on topics related to price benchmarking, solution review, and contract assessment for IT infrastructure. Ricky's responsibilities include leading Everest Group's cloud price benchmarking offering. Mukesh Rajnan is a vice president, is the information technology services team at Everest Group, leading research in the areas of enterprise digital transformation, cloud and traditional infrastructure, next generation network infrastructure, digital workplace, and cyber security. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Ricky. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, big welcome to all and thank you for joining us today to have a conversation on a very interesting topic, right? Realizing value from cloud. <clears throat> I think uh, the last two to three years have seen enterprises perform wholesale migrations to the public cloud, right? And But without a concrete strategy, it has obviously led to some challenges with respect to really measuring the real value from cloud. Uh, how much, how, how do you measure your ROI from your cloud investments? Uh, today, we're going to talk about what are some of those challenges uh, which are impeding enterprises in terms of measuring and deriving value from the cloud investments. Uh, we will try and attempt in terms of defining how some enterprises have actually implemented a framework in terms of how will they measure value uh, from, from the cloud investments and then also share some best practices in terms of how some of some enterprises uh, based on a research and advisory angle have actually been able to successfully do that. Uh, if to get started, I think set, setting some context, uh, we do this key issues survey every year. And I think over the last two years, the observations have, the, the, the findings have been very consistent. Uh, if you look at the top five, uh, top next generation capability priorities that enterprises are focusing on globally, uh, the ranks remain unchanged. Cloud and cybersecurity continue to remain at the top, right? And uh, COVID sort of I was, I was acted as a big catalyst to sort of drive more of this cloud adoption back in 2020, but now it has only accelerated further and we see enterprises spending sizable amount of their IT, uh, IT budgets every year on various cloud, uh, cloud solutions. However, I think uh, Mukesh is going to talk about some, some of the real challenges that we see enterprises facing when trying to measure value from their cloud investments. Yeah. Thanks, Ricky. So um, as Ricky pointed out and you know very rightly laid out in terms of the challenges enterprises are facing today uh, from a value generation standpoint. And even before that, even when we before we start to talk about value, I think a lot of challenges are uh, kind of causing enterprises not to realize the full value out of their investments. Now, the first, you know, we'll go through some of this and we'll also see some of this in more detail. But to highlight a few, I think the first one is low return on cloud investments. Now, a lot of enterprises start the expectation that they are going to get a lot of benefits as they move to cloud, especially in terms of cost. But as they do it, they realize they have not pulled the right levers into do not get the expected amount of benefits. Second is uh, there are a lot of compliance requirements in terms of cloud, and if not planned proper, properly, that becomes a big challenge. Um, a lot of enterprises in different verticals, such as banking, have a lot of legacy workloads. Now, there also people face a lot of challenges in terms of adopting cloud to its full potential. Then when we talk about cross cloud, and we also received a few questions uh, from 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 some of our um, viewers today that what is multi cloud and you know how the um, you know what the adoption in terms of multi cloud now the adoption is quite high, but also the complexity that is arising due to multi cloud adoption has gone up significantly, and that's another challenge that enterprises are uh, facing today. Then sustainability is a big theme. Environmental concerns are increasing at that's on top of uh, most enterprises agenda. We also talk, we also see a lot of industry specific challenges, right? Which, which because cloud is a lot of cloud adoption is more horizontal in nature being driven by the hyperscalers and that industry contextualization is missing. 
and finally one of the most important challenges around talent retention and also pricing related to this and Ricky why don't you double click on this issue and talk about this in a bit more detail absolutely thanks mukesh i think um, this conversation will not remain complete if we don't touch upon pricing right and especially the last one year where we've seen a big uh, challenge in terms of getting the right talent retaining the right talent and of course providers cost of shot through the roof and as well as and that is a resultant increase in terms of what prices different vendors are charging out there in the market right uh, the, the, i think if you look at these charts something which is something very distinct emerges right so if you look at the two curves one stands for traditional it skills one stands the gray bar the gray chart stands for the cloud skills and distinctly you see that post 2019 and just at the beginning of the pandemic we saw we see cloud getting into its own steep curve and even uh, during the height of the pandemic when, when there was a slowdown in terms of it spending let's say in, in h2 of 2020 we saw there was a dip in terms of the prices for it so for traditional it skills right because a lot of enterprises were trying to cut down discretionary spend but there were two areas which sort of continued to command a premium in pricing and that was really cloud and cyber security and that is manifested in these curves so if you the cloud continues to command sort of a premium in pricing cloud engineers uh, continue to command uh, great salaries and uh, but the good part is that this, this the supply demand equation is getting better day by day we see a lot of people getting upskilled we see a lot of providers investing into upskilling and uh, multi-skilling their resources getting uh, getting their resources certified on various cloud platforms however i think we still anticipate that this challenge in terms of uh, scarcity of the right talent the right cloud sort of talent that we that is really required to take enterprises to the next phase of the cloud journey will be in short demand and uh, the this will continue to plague most enterprises IT budgets. Yep. Now, if we yep. and, yeah, so and also to make this a bit real, right? Um, you know, in terms of we talked about enterprises facing a lot of challenges. And where this is stemming from is that a lot of enterprises are not able to define the expected value at the beginning of their cloud journey right so the challenge is part of it comes later but even when they're starting to go ahead and begin their cloud journey we see enterprises not defining the value and these are some of the enterprise quotes with whom which we um, with whom we have interacted recently so the first one really talks about um, a cio of a, of a consumer goods company who were trying to carve out from their parent company and planning to move applications to azure now they faced a lot of challenges in this journey and were not able to really think around what they were expected to do or how they should define value. And they were expecting their partner to help them in this journey. The second one, uh, we were talking to a manufacturing company, the CF manufacturing company, and what they highlighted was that you know they took a first, they took a cloud initiative a couple of years back, but they did not, it was not successful because um, they you know moved to cloud without putting the right amount of thought in this. And finally, uh, we talk about uh, see a quote from a CEO of a multinational life sciences company. I think there the challenge was again, you know, basically what they highlighted was if in the beginning we had better idea around what could be the possible budget leakages. And this is a very common challenge across different enterprises, right? And compliance related complexity that will crop up later. Then they would have started their journey differently and they would have defined value in a much different way. And now they are just trying to, you know, kind of rebuild and uh, do the entire thing from scratch again, right? So some of these challenges really stemming up from not defining value at the beginning of cloud journeys. Um, so let us uh, let us also take a pulse check from the uh, audience. Ricky, you want to do that? Sure, perfect. I think uh, let's open up the floor to the audience and uh, get your inputs. So I think the question on the screen is, uh, have you clearly defined the expected value that you wish to realize from a cloud investments? Uh, and we'd love to hear from you in terms of, was it well-documented, well-defined at the beginning, or was it in partly well-defined, or is it more of, we're still sort of going to do that, or is it more like, no, we were just, we never thought of defining it that way. Um, we'll close the poll in 
थ्री टू वन राइट थैंक यू सो आई थिंक अनएक्सपेक्टेडली आई थिंक फिफ्टी वन परसेंट और मोर ऑफ द the uh, the the poll uh, the audience have actually suggested that uh, there were some parts of the puzzle that were defined of course and documented but not really very well defined i think that's inherent that that's inherently the challenge with cloud right i mean uh, solving or trying to define the value of your business case from cloud is a multifaceted multidimensional sort of a challenge challenge that i think plus it's pretty unique to a lot of enterprises so for every enterprise the journey for, so for two enterprises the journey on to cloud cannot be the same so the way they go about creating their cloud journey or their road map and the way they define it will be very unique to each enterprise so uh, solving for it is a multi dimensional problem that we're going to try and address today on the call um any any surprises there mukesh or were they mostly in line with what you expected yeah actually you know it was very much in line with what i expected right because in most enterprises there is some part into this right therefore we see that most uh, people have voted for that somewhat they have thought about this but it's really not documented and what that means it's that it is not structured in any manner right because if it was structured and well thought through it would be a part of your discussions uh, with your service providers it would be a part of some of the documentation the contracts right but all of it is not there today and that is what uh, we'll try and kind of you know address yeah. in in today's webinar yep yep all right um if we if we look at how the cloud adoption mindset has changed right and i think this also goes back to the previous slide where we where we saw the audience also for sort of finding finding a challenging to really define the value of cloud it's because now cloud has sort of manifested itself i sort of transform moved from being an it decision to a more of a business decision right so that's the more that that's the new cloud adoption mindset that we sort of are seeing uh it's shifting from a focus of cost and efficiency this efficiency to driving more business focused growth and experience right so let's let's look at where it was prior to 2020 so it was primarily cloud was considered as more of an infrastructure platform it started off as a way to host your infrastructure achieve hyperscale capabilities and the core objectives in there were really around it modernization uh come the pandemic and 2020 onwards we saw that there was a group of early adopters who really started realizing while the majority of the organization started their cloud journey and close to 2020 there was a group of early adopters who were very strong and they realized that uh cloud is more than just infrastructure just an infrastructure platform and the real value to cloud is using some of the cloud native features right which enable uh, the digitalization of your core core business operation so in a way if you think about it cloud accelerates and in some cases in fact in fact it uh, it unlocks the implementation of uh, sort of the latest technologies and digitalization solutions even in your back office it could be a, an analytics driven accounting platform it could be talent management uh, so organizations that uh, shift to public cloud could potentially unlock additional value by repurposing and uh, reskilling their workforce right to focus on higher for them for them to focus on more higher value tasks such as developing products and services that address customer demands um uh, i think now uh, looking in the future i think we will anticipate and we've already seen some early adopters do that we anticipate more companies will start to see the real benefits of cloud which have been uh, long heralded as uh, something of a being of a catalyst for innovation and digital transformation so thanks to the ability to increase development speed and provide near limitless scale so uh, if you think about it for ceos cloud adoption will become not just an engine for revenue growth and efficiency but its speed scale innovation and productivity benefits they will become essential to the pursuit of broader digital business opportunities right and not just in the current future but well into the future uh, so companies in the future will consider cloud uh, for their innovation driven business growth from new and enhanced use cases be it in analytics iot and automation uh let's let's do a double click on it and mukesh if you could help us explain in terms of where different enterprises are in their journey yeah thanks thanks ricky so i think you know this slide kind of uh, at a high level represents how enterprises need to make the shift in their mindset into to really get the maximum value out of cloud and gain competitive advantage right so if you talk about the x axis and see how this has evolved from efficiency to digital to value generation so you'll see that on the left hand side it was a lot about industrialization 
right? So it was bringing the efficiency benefits, cost benefits. So a lot of enterprises were essentially just focusing on that. And the aim was that, you know, you want to move to cloud very quickly, right? Now, in the next phase, and this I'd say, you know, from, from around 2018, 2019, this started and accelerated uh, during the COVID phase also was movement towards cloud for digital. And the focus became a lot more on digitizing enterprise operations and trying to meet the business requirements. Now, there also it's still limited to, um, you know, it, it's still not talking about the value, right? And value has differently different components, which we'll see. But just to give some view into, into it, and if you look at the y-axis, so you see from low to high, we move from things such as cost saving, efficiency, risk mitigation. Uh, and when you're talking about cloud for digital, we are talking about things such as business agility. It also starts to touch upon something like stakeholder experience. But when we are talking about cloud for value, we are further moving one step ahead. And then we are talking about things such as business innovation, brand equity, stakeholder experience. And this is about really transforming the business and driving the next phase of growth uh, in, in any enterprise, right? So we'll talk about a bit more of this uh, on the next slide. Yep. So what we'll try and now do is really get into the meat of this webinar today and we'll try and define value, which is the real struggle for most enterprises as they embark on their transformation journey. And we'll also try and um, quantify some of the quali qualitative factors that are there when we talk about value. So um, I think firstly, you know, just to start off with a data point and why we are having this research discussion today and why this is very important is that this was a recent survey that we did where we found out that 67% of enterprises felt that they are not able to realize the expected value out of their cloud investments. Now, um, when we talk about value and we try to get this answer from different enterprises, we interacted with different people and asked them this question. So what do you mean by value? And essentially a lot of the focus was around cost benefits to begin with. And then there are also inputs around, you know, business benefits. We want to do more innovation. Uh, we also want to ensure that we are compliant with whatever regulations are there for a particular industry. So what we did is we tried and bucket all of the factors into broad uh, categories. And we really realized that most of the value conversation was getting captured under three broad buckets. And that was business cost factors, efficiency factors, and strategic factors for an enterprise. Now, if you do a further double click into this and uh, try and identify what are some of the, uh, we can be on the same slide. We can, yeah. And if you do, you know, one more double click queue into this, right? So essentially there are five components that, you know, we that are coming out distinctly based on which we can define value. So first one is monetary, which is very self-explanatory because um, when we define value, people are looking for cost improvements and efficiencies uh, in, in their overall investments. We see a lot of adoption of uh, cloud economic solutions, et cetera. Um, then we talk about innovation. So there, when you talk about innovation, it's how quickly an enterprise can really change their solution and really come up with new ideas, new products in the market. Just as an example, uh, you know, if I have to talk about, say, the Uber application and when there were had uh, you know boats coming in the in the application which was more of a very interactive experience for uh, for users so things like that right now how do we quickly make some of these changes for for your uh, in your application or in your products that's that's about innovation and that's also a measure of value that we are talking about then when we talk about compliance so certain industries such as healthcare or banking they need a lot of uh, focus on compliant, they to be to remain compliant with uh, government standards. And within that, if you have to put in efforts beyond what you're doing in, on cloud, typically that tends to be a value leakage point of uh, point, right? So that also needs to be uh, covered. Resilience, resilience is a very important factor. And especially when we talk about the recessionary environment today, most enterprises are looking to make their business resilient. And therefore that also needs to be a component of the value that is being generated for enterprises, and we are talking about it. 
and finally agility right so how can you quickly and rapidly evolve to achieve some of your business outcomes so, so mukesh we have also yeah. heard about uh, if we if we stay on the previous slide even if you we heard we've heard a lot about finops right so and it being a becoming a very important art and science of managing your, your cloud cost yeah. optimization so where does finops come into play here yeah great question and i think we also received this question from some some of the viewers today and a finops is a part of you know value in cloud definition right and the mistake a lot of enterprises often make is that they equate finops to value so the focus remains on um, you know identifying cost benefits and that's where it usually limits to i think finops is a very important co uh, component today and the focus is mostly on monetary and the resilience component of the value that we are trying to define today got it okay okay uh, if you move on yeah so this one is another interesting view and this one takes a view of um, you know while we have defined value it still sounds more theoretical but in the next two slides we'll try and make it more practical as to how you can go about this and how you can go about adoption of this uh, particular framework that we talked about now here what we are trying to do is um, we are trying to see the <clears throat> impact of different challenges that enterprises face across the value metrics that we have defined right and it also equates to value leakages that are happening within an enterprise right if i have to take an example um and i'll actually walk through this so essentially what we have observed is that in terms of value realization for enterprises most challenges can be bucketed across people process and technology so when you talk about people for example there is a lot of inefficient collaboration among internal teams we see that the it and business are not talking to each other even within businesses different groups are not talking to each other what this leads to is very slow innovation right and therefore what we have highlighted here is that the extent of impact on the value metric as innovation is highest so when we are talking about cloud value and if an enterprise is trying to really be very innovative and innovate at a fast pace they will suffer if there is you know inefficient collaboration uh, collaboration um, collaboration among internal teams right so the impact is highest on innovation in this case similarly if we take the second point uh, from people standpoint then we are seeing that there is a competency gap to support enterprise growth and that will again lead to a impact direct impact on innovation when we talk about some of the process related challenges that enterprises face now if we think about uh, something like delay in product release so delay in product release will directly lead to loss in monetary benefits it will also lead to loss in innovation right because you'll not be able to make those changes fast and the competition can also uh, try and overtake some overtake um, to in that aspect then we talk about cloud cost overrun during cloud uh, cost overrun during cloud migration now that impacts monetary and it also impacts compliance related, uh, related you know value that that can that an enterprises that an enterprise can get if we talk about some more aspects of these challenges um and i'm not going one by one because a lot of this becomes self explanatory but if we talk about cyber security incident right now cyber security incidents will impact everything from you know monetary to resilience to agility and there will be value leakage if there is a cyber security incident happening within an enterprise however the most impact will be in terms of resilience right that will show that the enterprise is not resilient and can get impacted by any any change in future which will eventually lead to lack of shareholder trust lack of uh, share values for the enterprise and therefore there is serious impact overall now therefore the you know if i have to kind of take a couple of minutes and try to summarize in terms of you know what how enterprises should think about this particular slide and you know if we tie it back to the previous slide and then we'll also see one more uh, in terms of how we can quantify it i think listing down your challenges right in terms of what are the challenges you are facing across your people process and technology related initiatives and essentially if you think about value where in the overall um value chain you are not able to realize value or where do you think that value leakage is happening once you are able to map that out right you will be able to 
create a framework or create a tool based on which you can actually quantify even the even things such as innovation compliance resiliency which are more qualitative factors and it's important to have that view right because one because unless and until you have that view you'll be talking at a very high level we also received certain questions on this particular point in terms of you know whether we have built that kind of a tool uh, based on which you know we can we can measure value during before migration during migration post migration and so on so we have uh, created a framework in terms of how that can be done and i'll hand it over to vicky to walk us through one example of an enterprise in terms of how um, you know that has been done perfect uh, thanks mukesh i think if we uh, go to the next slide there is a real example of how we've done this for uh, one of one of the leading enterprise uh, in the, in north america so uh, i think as i was talking about earlier the way every company measures value from the cloud is very unique and very particular to them right so this is one manifestation as mukesh mentioned right again the the relative importance of each parameter will be unique to each organization but we've created something which sort of will work for a lot of organizations and which using which they can take some inspiration from so if you were to try and define where each organization is on their journey to cloud right so if we start looking at an organization which is relatively low mature just morely mostly evaluating cloud from a from a platform perspective from an infrastructure perspective leveraging some amount of cloud native services if you think that uh, i think of that kind of an organization they will mostly be focused on the dollar impact that cloud transformation can create right really without actually having an, a major business impact because the talent and plus because the talent is sort of evolving to quantify that dollar impact enterprise will actually look at the cost reduction in terms of the technology evolution or the and the overall cost incurred during the transformation exercise and we look at how that what sort of metrics does it manifest into um there will be a lot of focus on application downtime operational performance and making sure that the data is secure and these sort of take precedence with an which with an organization which is at a lower level of maturity while also evaluating the total re, uh, value realization from a cloud transformation engagement uh so we sort of what what we do is for th for this sort of an organization uh they will they will put the maximum amount of weightage or maximum amount of precedence to the monetary benefits uh which is nearly 60 to 65% uh compliance will of course take second place and agility followed by agility re uh, resilience and innovation now if you try and quantify um, how some of these organizations or enterprises are trying to define the monetary value realized from cloud they are looking at for example what is the cost of the transformation itself right what is the cost of migration or the modernization exercise they are looking at what is the technology cost after cloud adoption uh they were looking at what is the talent cost after cloud adoption right what sort of talent what sort of people resources would be required to maintain and manage this platform uh they look at things around uh, and in fact the, the, if you notice the relative importance given to things around the impact on business top line after cloud adoption will be very limited right because this is because this is an organization which is at a low, slightly lower maturity phase they will still treat this majorly as an it exercise as an, or an it modernization objective uh if you look at well uh, the, the second most important parameter in their bucket which is really around compliance the relative importance given to the, the three or four parameters of course the data sovereignty comes at the top followed by data visibility and security and uh, the organizational governance uh, so again this could vary if you've seen uh, in organizations in your have a slightly more be a weightage being assigned to factors such as compliance and data sovereignty in north america is slightly lesser but again this could vary uh, similarly followed by agility uh, in here as well agility we see a lot of organizations placing a lot of emphasis in terms of the flexibility that the cloud platform can offer in terms of services uh, how how does it make your overall operating model resilient what sort of flexibility does it offer in terms of application portability and interoperability and how does it impact my employee productivity uh, so if you think about it uh, and then finally followed by innovation and resilience which are relatively lesser in the hierarchy for a low maturity organization but if you were to try and manifest it to sort of make 
make it a bit more real for in, our, in terms of measuring innovation and govern, uh, resilience. I think innovation is something which a lot of mid to large, uh, mid to high maturity organizations will have a lot of focus on. And we've seen a lot of emphasis being placed on is really reduction in the technical debt, right? Uh, the customer experience, uh, the employee hours, which are the, the amount of effort that they have to expend in terms of uh, dedicating to innovation, the pace of new products release. Uh, if you look at res resilience, if they look at what's the, what's the typical expected downtime, how does it impact the overall operational performance, and how does it impact the application observability. So uh, overall, this is how a low maturity organization would typically look at measuring their investments or measuring their uh, ROI from cloud. If you were to hypothetically, if you were to uh, extrapolate this for a medium or a high maturity operation, uh, typically the weightages across so the framework will remain very similar, right? It'll be measured across monetary innovation, compliance, resilience, and agility. However, I think the relative weightages, the relative precedence or hierarchy assigned to these different metrics might be very different. Uh, for example, we've typically seen clients in uh, enterprises in the, in the mid to high maturity phase assign less weightage to monetary and much more weightage to innovation. In fact, high maturity organizations will in fact uh, have the highest amount of weightage assigned to innovation and agility because because that's where uh, they start appreciating cloud as a business enabler and not just as a IT digital or, or an IT platform. So uh, this is sort of trying to make the framework a bit more real. And I think, um, you know, if we can stay for, yeah, just stay for uh, one more minute, right? You know, we, we can also answer one of the questions that we received in the last slide. Um, and, you know, one of the questions was that does some of this, um, do some of these factors also change based on the stakeholders, right? So stakeholders uh, with whom we are interacting in terms of value delivery. And I think um, the answer is yes, right? Because for someone like a CIO, typically, you know, something like innovation, resilience, agility is more important. But if there is a CFO who is also getting involved in the mix, sometimes, you know, they'd want to focus more on monetary. But, you know, and again, when we are trying to define a value, it will be a combination of all of these things, right? And that's where, um, you know, this framework becomes really helpful in trying to quantify and come up to a value. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, we get, so now, you know, when we talk about this, right, and uh, we have defined the value framework in terms of how enterprises can measure value. We'll talk about some of the levers that um, we are seeing enterprises leverage today. And, you know, this is basically there can be more things, but what we have observed is that these four are areas where we have um, seen maximum benefits in terms of enterprises moving towards that value generation path or moving towards stabilization of that value. And uh, what we've also tried to do is highlight what is the current maturity of enterprises for all of these value realization levers. So the first one is index, industry contextualization of cloud. And we touched upon this briefly that usually what um, you know, we are observing is that cloud, you know, a lot of cloud is, uh, consumption today is happening from hyperscalers like so AWS, Azure, and GCP, who do not provide any kind of industry contextualization. And therefore, enterprises fail to, um, you know, realize value, and they need to do a lot of changes on top of it, and they need to do a, um, a lot of contextualization. And therefore, you know, typically it takes a lot of effort to get to the desired value that enterprises want, right? So if that can be brought in at the beginning, generally people have ten, uh, people tend to do better than this. Ricky was talking about sovereignty, right? So especially in uh, Europe, in the you know Europe, and um, this is also starting to pick up in some other regions. What we have observed is that data sovereignty uh, concerns are significant, and if there is any leakage, right, or if there is any incident that happens along those lines, there is a huge drop in value that enterprises um, face because of you know multiple issues such as lack in trust among shareholders and so on, right? So cloud sovereignty has become a very important value generation lever from that standpoint. Sustainable cloud infrastructure. Now, um, again, we'll be also kind of double clicking into this, but what has happened over the last one or two years? Now, sustainability as a theme has been around for say last 10 years, 12 years when it started, but in the last one or two years, 
a lot of enterprises have be have become really conscious and there is this wave across the world and think even as individual users people have become very conscious about sustainability and cloud has potential to um create a lot of sustainable benefits we hear a lot of green cloud and other initiatives being taken by hyperscalers um and therefore enterprises also starting to question um and also brainstorm internally as to how can they create a more sustainable cloud infrastructure right and uh, one more point on this is that the lot of initiatives today happening are uh, even we talk about sustainable cloud infrastructure are more aligned to CO2 reduction or reducing the carbon footprint but going forward we'll see this getting manifested in more areas right and it will directly link to the value that an enterprise is expecting to create because value will not be just internal for them it will also be external in terms of what they are doing for the community as a whole and then finally cloud economics uh, and like you also asked the question on this earlier this is definitely one of the key levers of value generation for enterprises and this is one lever where we have seen higher maturity among enterprises i think the rest three are areas where people are still de developing those capabilities but cloud economics uh, we have seen significant adoption there are good solutions available out in the market the hyperscalers have themselves invested in cloud economic solution in terms of how people can reduce uh, costs and make everything more efficient for their uh, internal system so um, that is the fourth uh, value generation lever and what we'll do today is uh, given the time we'll click into one of these in more detail and we'll focus on cloud sovereignty right so kind of you know um, just double click into uh, in cloud clicking into cloud sovereignty now some of the key objectives right and it's important to understand um, where all of this is coming from and especially if we talk about europe as a region the most enterprises have been reluctant to have data shared outside of europe right and uh, especially after the us cloud act that came came back i think something around 2018 or 19 where the us agencies could access data from europe if there were certain criteria being met i think there is a lot of um, concerns around data privacy and that's where a lot of sovereign cloud initiative uh, among enterprises accelerated within europe and now if we just try to you know, think of it at a high level the two most important objectives that enterprises want to uh, cater to are one is ensuring that they have regulatory geo and industry specific compliance and second that they have access and control over the enterprises data and um therefore you know to to unlock the maximum potential of 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 uh, cloud they are ensuring that cloud sovereignty is being built in right from the very beginning and again the industry factor also comes into play which we were talking earlier in terms of you know a lot of this cloud value and when you try to use that framework which we presented in terms of you know how do we put weightages across different parameters it will also vary by industry vary by geography now when you are talking about sovereign cloud and its uh, current focus and current adoption in europe we see that public cloud is the highest followed by bfs and hls and then we have um, uh, other enterprises also starting to adopt and we also seen that you know from a survey data point that around 8 to 85% of european enterprises have highlighted it as a key requirement within their cloud solutions that they expect their service provider partners to bring or their technology partners to bring in and therefore if we tie it back to value the component around data sovereignty will be much higher than some of the other components the components around compliance will be also higher even for enterprises who would be beginning on their cloud transformation journey right so that's how some of this contextualization can come in and these are the four levers which we talked about in the last slide based on which uh, enterprises can seek to maximize the value that they get now yeah if you move on uh ricky can you also talk about you know how enterprises can think about the criteria that uh, that enter, uh, that they should think about for selecting the right partner if they're taking the partner route yeah 
I think uh, because a lot of large enterprises usually because they don't have the right talent or the right skill set and the ability, they also are, of course, working with third party vendors, they're working with the hyperscaler partners or some of the larger system integrators, big four companies to sort of uh, uh, support them on their cloud journeys, right? So we were trying to evaluate basis multiple deans in terms of what are some of those parameters which enterprises are usually keeping at the top and keep giving importance to when they're choosing the right partner right uh, at the top of uh, the came the quality of the solution so first and foremost uh, unexpectedly the quality of the solution right how is your cloud transformation journey what are your previous capabilities uh, what sort of uh, commitments are you offering uh, or how much expected downtime due to the migration how will you manage the risk right so those aspects of the solution become the most important and the most relevant talked about points when evaluating a, a partner's proposal or capability the second, I think, again, becomes uh, especially more important in the context of cloud, right? Because we are talking about being ability, the ability to work uh, in an ecosystem with other partners, right? Be it with the with your tradition, with the traditional apps, application support, or the application maintenance vendor, uh, the enterprise may already have working with the traditional. Because most enterprises, uh, very rarely you see enterprises have a hundred percent estate on public cloud, right? So they'll have a combination of part of their estate being on public, part of their estate being on 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 premise, right? So how do you work with your on premise partner? How do you work with your uh, business process owners? Uh, so the interoperability, interoper ability to work together with partners at times, because a lot of organizations are also adopting multi-cloud strategy, right? So you may be able, need, you may require as a partner to also work with a with a competing hyperscaler at times. And we're going to talk about one important question that we will try try and address around polycloud as well. Um, the, the third is really around what sort of references, case studies uh, are you bringing to the table? And this case studies and references, not just from a perspective of what have you done in the financial services industry, but what have you done specifically in the reinsurance or in the banking industry, right? So it's very, very specific, specific to industry sector, specific to similar scopes, right? So how how have you sort of done these sort of transformations with a, with a 20,000 server estate or with an estate which has 50,000 end users, right? So those sort of complexities are important to consider. Consider. And then finally, um, and I think unexpectedly, the price or the, co the the cost that the vendor has proposed sort of becomes the second uh, level of filter. The first is, of course, the quality and other things. But uh, we're also seeing a lot of deals where uh, some of the some of the vendors, what they're doing is they're proposing sort of a mixture of outcome-based deals as well. So not to say that the entire deal fee is sort of based on how successful the transformation is, but they're saying that, okay, 70% of my fees is fixed, but uh, let's say the remaining 30% is spec to something called as an outcome and the outcome may be defined across multiple things. One of the examples could be uh, customer satisfaction, right? So they'll clearly define that basis, the basis, these parameters, basis meeting these uh, output requirements will be able to earn back that 30% or maybe in fact potentially earn 40 or 50% of that fees as well. So uh, there are some deals which are happening, but the, the, the emphasis is and there is a lot of transparency that is expected from third party partners in terms of flexibility in putting that skin in the game, uh, more transparency, proposing unit based pricing, right? Not just of black box fixed fee pricing. And I don't know what am I paying for really how does it scale up and down so that bit of transparency and flexibility sort of uh, become the bare minimum requirement when they're evaluating partners if you move on I think uh, the conversation again sort of also uh, when you're working with, to choose with outsourced partners, the conversation also remains incomplete if we don't address the question around what pricing model works well right so because we've seen a lot of debates a lot of Trying to, a lot of companies trying to innovate in this area. Uh, if we go back to the basics, right, when it comes to cloud managed services, something like resource unit based pricing, which has been around for so long and very most large enterprises are very used to it, right? They're very used to the concept of arc rooks and how the pricing goes up or goes down basis uh, scalers. Uh, they're very used to that, right? So obviously it provides more transparent to, transparency to the client. It provides them the view that, okay, if I'm at, I, if I'm spinning up 2000 VMs, if I spin up 3000 VMs in the next month, I know what am I gonna pay in terms of managed services. So it, it also, from a provider perspective, 
perspective, it also resembles, truly resembles their internal cost structure, right? Because they also need to scale up or scale down uh, the, the resources at the back end based on that. Uh, however, I think there are some inherent challenges, right? Because as we spoke about now, cloud is more than an infrastructure platform. We need to go beyond just VMs and storage. We need to look at more cloud native services, right? We're seeing, for example, a lot of, lot of uh, enterprises leverage cloud native uh, uh, serverless functions or something called as AWS Lambda or Azure functions, right? So uh, from a provider perspective, there are some inherent challenges in terms of coming up that re coming up with the resource unit based pricing. Plus the, the better is that there are hundreds of such services, right? There's AWS Lambda, there's Beanstalk and so on. So you can really, literally, it's a big long list of services. How do you possibly come up with a resource unit based pricing for each and or each and every service, right? And plus, in some cases, the the num the, the quantity of these sub the services is very suboptimal, right? You might be using a few databases on pass or pass database, whereas the majority of your estate would be on on-premise, right? So it becomes really challenging to maintain and manage such a big roster of uh, rate card and resource units. Uh, so, to, so sort of, uh, and the other challenge with resource and based pricing, right, and which is inherent to the cloud model is, for example, if I'm using as an enterprise, if I'm using spot VMs, right, and if I'm using spot VM for a few hours or a few days, how does the how does it get built to the built to the service provider, right? So because traditionally these these pricing models have been pegged to something like per VM per month or per TB managed per month, right? So how does it work when I spin up a few VMs for a few hours or a few days, right? So how what 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 how do I pay for that? So th those are some inherent challenges, right? I mean because the nature of the resource nature of the estate is very ephemeral. The, so sort of to mitigate that, uh, we see a lot of service providers use something which is called as a percent percentage of spend model, which essentially is say, which says that if as an enterprise, you're spending 10 million on the cloud, I am going to, as a service provider, I'm going to charge you 10% of that, which is roughly 100K, uh, which is roughly a million dollars. So uh, very simply speaking, that could be one way to sort of charge for that. However, I think if you if you think about it, at times you may end up overestimating the the, the fees. If you, you may end up under underestimating the fees at times. I think if you think about it also, the provider's incentive to actually reduce the cloud spend, right? because they are getting a percentage of what the client is actually spending on cloud. So they never incentivize or motivate you to actually reduce the amount of money that the when the vendor the, the enterprise is spending on cloud. So that's an inherent flaw in this model. I think this model has been around for some time since 2018 or so, but then we've not seen significant adoption of this model because there are some inherent challenges. Even from a service provider perspective, there are some inherent challenges, right? How do you staff the right set of people? Because uh, you, the, the, the skill set required for managing something called something like a data proc service is very different from a skill set required to managing more traditional infrastructure, right? So that, that's an inherent challenge. And the third is, of course, very straightforward, which is really a fixed fee model. Um, very straightforward, gives the client visibility into the total spend, uh, reduces risk, typically reduces the complexity, and it's very feasible for a small, stable size environment. But of course, it doesn't provide that much flexibility and uh, not very transparent and gives the limit visibility for the client into what are the real cost drivers and of course it's not very helpful uh, where the client's environment is highly variable just we, just as we spoke about right if you're using too many spot pms if you're using too many of uh, ephemeral weekday or weekly out uh, workload then probably this sort of a model again win may not be may not work so again um, let's open the floor let's let's get input from our audience in terms of what sort of pricing model are you using when working with uh, your outsourcing system integration partners? Is it still time and material? Is it fixed fee? Is it resource unit based? Uh, is it or is it percentage of spend model, which is relatively rare? All right, uh, closing the poll in three, two, one. Right, thank you. Um, I, I think as is the case unexpectedly, uh, percentage of spend model is just 4% of the overall respondents here and majority is sort of dominated by uh, resource unit based. And I think there are still a lot of legacy contracts. I think not legacy, I would say a traditional way of working with which is time and material, right? I mean, uh, where you see um, where there are there are certain situations where you're talking of DevOps, more high end work, time and material does seem to work well with that sort of in that sort of an environment. And I think 
unexpectedly fixed fee is sort of the most dominant model because a lot of enterprises are still uh, going back to something that they understand clearly and gives them certainty and visibility in terms of how much they will exactly spend. So no surprises there really. Okay. Um, so we'd like to offer um, uh, from a, a complimentary inquiry with Mukesh and team. Mukesh, if you could just throw some light on this. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just quickly walk through this, right? Um, we kind of engage with different enterprises across different, um, you know, in terms of the, across different engagements, right? And we have tried to highlight at a, you know, at a high level what we can help you with. So first one is if you want to go deep into any topic that we have discussed today, or about cloud and infrastructure services also you can reach out to you you can reach you can reach out to us for a 30 to 60 minute analyst inquiry session and we'd be happy to hop on a call and um you know bring our insights onto the table second one uh, we can also help you benchmark some of your existing practices against what your peers are doing against what's the best in class industry practice um, that will help you drive efficient and informed decisions and also help you create a future roadmap. We have recently done it for, uh, for some of the enterprises who have benefited from this hugely. And finally, for the procurement and sourcing groups that are there on the call, we can offer really deep insights into sourcing decisions based on some of the Everest Group Peak Matrix Assessment Research we do where we do uh, track different service providers um, across different dimensions. So the cloud, the cloud peak matrix assessment will be very relevant for some of the audience who are on the call here, right? So you know you can just feel free to reach out to um, you know to my email ID listed here, and uh, I'd be happy to revert back. Move on. And finally, I think um, we've also done an exhaustive business case analysis, uh, supporting a lot of enterprises in terms of evaluating the business case and figuring out or benchmarking their cloud uh, business case or cloud costs. So we sort of have expertise in terms of evaluating business case across the entire cloud value chain, starting at starting from the cloud consulting or the assessment bit, moving to the cloud transformation migration or the modernization phase where you're sort of lifting and shifting workloads to the cloud. And then finally, you get into the operate phase, which which is really around IS and PaaS estates. And sort of the underlying, uh, the end, underpin to all of this is of course the cloud foundation setup or the uh, landing zone setup and setting up a cloud center of excellence, uh, which drives the, the overall program and adoption and change management. And finally, a layer of security, which sort of also underpins the entire cloud transformation journey so we sort of have capability and expertise in terms of benchmarking what each of these different phases should cost you ideally and how do you compare against the market so i'm um, happy to sort of do talk more in terms of how would you go about doing a business case across this entire value chain all right um i think we can leave the last few minutes for any questions so uh, one very interesting question which came up, uh, and I think Mukesh, your best place to answer this was really around what is what is the optimal uh, polycloud mix in your opinion? And what is it that you've seen enterprises uh, be comfortable with in terms of that optimal polycloud mix? Yeah, so uh, what we have observed is that generally most enterprises have two or three um, public cloud environments in their state. And out of that, we have seen that one of it usually is the primary cloud provider and has around 50 to 70 percent, depending on depending on the industry vertical usually. And then the other providers are being used for more specific tasks. For example, if someone has AWS as a primary provider, they could be leveraging something like GCP for um, a special focus area such as analytics uh, on their applications or certain uh, business groups might be wanting to, you know, they have a Microsoft stack and they might want to leave the Azure. So that might also be present within the enterprise. So generally we have observed this kind of a mix to be most prevalent right now um, among enterprises. Got it. Any other questions that, uh, that, that we should uh, pick up from the long list of questions. I think there is one you... question around pricing, uh, whether if you have observed a recent plateau in the salaries for cloud-focused IT personnel globally. 
in the recent times i think uh, we're definitely starting to sort of hit the peak in certain markets uh, i wouldn't say that's true globally or universally however i think uh, so we've certainly hit the plateau in certain markets i think goes back to the point where we said that service providers have been spending a lot of time and money in terms of upscaling we, because i think cloud is some, so it has sort of democratized uh, the market really right so uh, we see a lot of people who are not even relevant or not from this industry sector as well trying to upskill cross skill themselves trying to spend a sort of uh, get themselves aws certified or azure certified so they can get into this industry I mean, uh, so so I think we're definitely seeing that supply demand equation to get a bit better. The, the amount of uh, supply is definitely going up in the market as we speak. So I think going forward, what will happen is in the next six to 12 months, we definitely see more of that happening. Plus, I think we also we, it may also happen that the demand side of the equation also sort of, of stabilizes compared to what we've been seeing over the last one year where demand has been seen a significant uptick. So maybe uh, we'll definitely see the peak in the next uh, six to 12 months. And I think we'll take one more question. So I see one question on what is your perspective of measuring the value of SaaS? Um, I think interesting question because generally, um, you know, the way we kind of try and put it out there is value measurement should be more broader, right? You know, we are talking about more of cloud adoption and cloud transformation. SaaS will be one component of it, right? And generally, um, what we believe is that when you're talking about SaaS, um, is it contextualized enough to the industry or the enterprise? That, that, that is adopting it, right? Sometimes SaaS solution can be used just as is, and sometimes you need to develop on top of it as well, right? So where it is being adopted as is, probably the linkage to value will not be direct, right? But when you're developing on top of it, that is where the conversation starts to move away from SaaS to more of an industry cloud kind of solution. And that ties back to value generation because we also talked about industry cloud as being one of the four levers for maximum value, maximizing value within enterprises. All right, I think this has been great. Uh, thank you so much everyone for joining. This has been a very interactive session and there are some questions which are pending. Uh, Mukesh and I will definitely try and uh, share our responses offline to some of those questions. Uh, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you everyone.